Hey, my friend, greetings and welcome back. These are the readings for day number 150 in the Digging Deeper Reading Plan. 1 Samuel 20, Psalm 103, and our second reading in Romans 7. Yesterday we heard of the slow escalation of David's problems stemming from Saul's jealousy. Saul made David his son-in-law, but only because of the hope that David would be killed by the Philistines. For only the first time in yesterday's reading, we heard how Saul was humbled because of the results of acting on his jealousy, but he doesn't learn from it. 1 Samuel 20 David now fled from Nioth in Ramah and found Jonathan. What have I done? he exclaimed. What is my crime? How have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? That is not true, Jonathan protested. You are not going to die. He always tells me everything he's going to do, even the little things. I know my father wouldn't hide something like this from me. It just isn't so. Then David took an oath before Jonathan and said, Your father knows perfectly well about our friendship, so he has said to himself, I won't tell Jonathan. Why should I hurt him? But I swear to you that I'm only a step away from death. I swear it by the Lord and by your own soul. Tell me what I can do to help you, Jonathan exclaimed. David replied, Tomorrow we celebrate the new moon festival. I've always eaten with the king on this occasion, but tomorrow I'll hide in the field and stay there until the evening of the third day. If your father asks where I am, tell him I asked permission to go home to Bethlehem for an annual family sacrifice. If he says, fine, you will know all is well. But if he is angry and loses his temper, you will know he is determined to kill me. Show me this loyalty as my sworn friend. For we made a solemn pact before the Lord. Or kill me yourself if I have sinned against your father, but please don't betray me to him. Never, Jonathan exclaimed. You know that if I had the slightest notion my father was planning to kill you, I would tell you at once. Then David asked, How will I know whether or not your father is angry? Come out to the field with me, Jonathan replied, and they went out together. Then Jonathan told David, I promise by the Lord, the God of Israel, that by this time tomorrow or the next day at the latest, I will talk to my father and let you know at once how he feels about you. If he speaks favorably about you, I will let you know. But if he is angry and wants you killed, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father, and may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a solemn pact with David, saying, May the Lord destroy all your enemies. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow of friendship again, for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. Then Jonathan said, Tomorrow we celebrate the new moon festival. You will be missed when your place at the table is empty. The day after tomorrow, toward evening, go to the place where you hid before and wait there by the stone pile. I will come out and shoot three arrows to the side of the stone pile as though I were shooting at a target. Then I will send a boy to bring the arrows back. If you hear me say, They're on this side, then you will know as surely as the Lord lives that all is well and there is no trouble. But if I tell him, Go farther, the arrows are still ahead of you, then it will mean that you must leave immediately. For the Lord is sending you away, and may the Lord make us keep our promises to each other, for he has witnessed them. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon festival began, the king sat down to eat. He sat at his usual place against the wall, with Jonathan sitting opposite him and Abner beside him. 
but David's place was empty. Saul didn't say anything about it that day, for he said to himself, something must have made David ceremonially unclean. But when David's place was empty again the next day, Saul asked Jonathan, why hasn't the son of Jesse been here for the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan replied, David earnestly asked me if he could go to Bethlehem. He said, Please let me go, for we are having a family sacrifice. My brother demanded that I be there, so please let me get away to see my brothers. That's why he isn't here at the king's table. Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. You stupid son of a whore! Do you think I don't know that you want him to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother? As long as that son of Jesse is alive, you'll never be king. Now go and get him so I can kill him. But why should he be put to death? Jonathan asked his father. What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at Jonathan, intending to kill him. So at last Jonathan realized that his father was really determined to kill David. Jonathan left the table in fierce anger and refused to eat on that second day of the festival, for he was crushed by his father's shameful behavior toward David. The next morning, as agreed, Jonathan went out into the field and took a young boy with him to gather his arrows. "'Start running,' he told the boy, "'so you can find the arrows as I shoot them.' So the boy ran, and Jonathan shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy had almost reached the arrow, Jonathan shouted, The arrow is still ahead of you. Hurry, hurry, don't wait. So the boy quickly gathered up the arrows and ran back to his master. He, of course, suspected nothing. Only Jonathan and David understood the signal. Then Jonathan gave his bow and arrows to the boy and told him to take them back to town. As soon as the boy was gone, David came out from where he had been hiding near the stone pile. Then David bowed three times to Jonathan with his face to the ground. Both of them were in tears as they embraced each other and said goodbye, especially David. At last Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn loyalty to each other in the Lord's name. The Lord is the witness of a bond between us and our children forever. Then David left, and Jonathan returned to the town. How it must please the Lord when we pray this psalm, which is another favorite. Note that the psalm starts and ends with the same line. Psalm 103 A Psalm of David let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. 
for he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and die. The wind blows and we are gone, as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children, of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels, who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom. Let all that I am praise the Lord. The second key to being released from the power of sin is God's Spirit. Verse 6. Paul then launched into an exposition of what he meant in verse 5, and I quote, When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. This explanation should not be construed to negate what he said in verse 6 and in the preceding chapters. Romans 7 Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So, my dear brothers, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ, and now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and might as well have killed me. I died, spiritually speaking, so I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me because I couldn't keep them. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin 
used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So the trouble is not the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand my own self, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. So if I do what I don't want to do, I am really not the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that lives on within me. So here is the dilemma. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but if I live according to my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Oh, what a miserable person I am! Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God, the answer is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 8, 1-4 So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. I want you to know, my friend, that it encourages me that you are listening to these podcasts. And it is a great joy, again, to pray with you. O Lord, our Lord, it is true that if we did not know about Christ or when we forget about Him, we are wretched people. And we cry out, who could deliver us from our wretched condition? And the glorious answer is, Christ Jesus has done that. He did that by coming with a body like we sinners have. And in that body, he gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins and dealt a death blow to sin's control over us. He fully fulfilled the requirements of the law for us. And now because we are one with Him, we no longer need to follow our sinful nature, but instead we must follow the Spirit. Therefore, if we are being led by that Spirit, There is no condemnation for us. We belong to Christ Jesus, and the Spirit is proof of that. Thank you, Lord, for freeing us from the law of sin and death. 
And so with the psalmist we say, Let all that I am praise you, Lord. With my whole heart I will praise you. Let all that I am praise you, Lord. May I never forget the good things you have done for me. You forgive all my sins and heal all my diseases. You have redeemed me from death and crowned me with love and tender mercies. Thank you.